It justifies the young picture in there. <laughs> Yes. Thank you, Tom. Uh, this, uh, this almost feels like uh, 35 years ago, actually, when I was presenting my fifth year thesis to you guys. Uh, um, Tom uh, already spoke about this. We, uh, in 1992, after the, uh, the recession that hit Canada, um, we started thinking globally. Um, at the time, China was just opening up. And as, a, as an office, we decided to uh, leap forward into China. And we were one of the few offices that went into China in 1992. And China gave us an amazing uh, global platform. Uh, from there, we were able to uh, get into India, into Singapore, Malaysia, and we're covering uh, Southeast Asia all from, uh, from there. And since then, uh, we uh, have grown into a a multidisciplinary design firm that incorporates uh, master planning, uh, commercial work. Uh, what you're looking on on the right-hand image is the uh, K11 tower. This was in Shanghai, uh, finished in 2002. Uh, in the middle, you're looking at a, a, an office tower that we did in uh, uh, Riyadh, uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, which unfortunately was put on hold. Uh, similarly, the one on the, on the left-hand side uh, is in Jeddah. Uh, they, these, these guys got put on hold 
after the uh, 2008 uh, uh, collapse. Uh, something we also do quite a bit in Asia, but you don't see much of it, of our work in, uh, in Canada is actually residential. This is a, um, a two million square meter uh, development, uh, 1.5 million square meters of residential sitting on top a uh, commercial and retail podium. We do quite a bit of that. We do a lot of cultural stuff, um, conference facilities, and educational facilities. We've been involved in doing educational facilities from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast in, uh, in, in Canada, as well as uh, right now we're actually doing some educational facilities in China uh, itself. Uh, we're currently involved with the uh, with the, some of the international schools that are up and operating in, uh, in China. And one of them is the uh, Canadian International School in Kunshan. Um, we do entertainment. We just finished the, uh, the aquarium in Toronto at the base of the CN Tower. We also do quite a bit of healthcare. Uh, this is one of our uh, first pioneer projects in Malaysia for a private uh, health provider. Um, it's uh, in, uh, uh, just outside of Kuala Lumpur. Uh, the client is Parkway Health. It's currently under construction. It is a campus that has 500 beds on top of a, a DNT block with uh, some support facilities and uh, office spaces. We also, uh, through our uh, office in Vancouver, we, uh, we have uh, an entire team that is actually totally dedicated to uh, hospitality. They do um, uh, mostly uh, high-end uh, five-star hotels. We've also uh, got involved in China with doing a lot of uh, industrial uh, work. This is a campus for GM. Uh, it's actually a research and development uh, facility um, uh, that, that is now going on uh, just outside of Shanghai in the suburbs in an area called Pudong. Um, and we also do quite a bit of retail. This one, we uh, got involved in rebranding uh, Pollen Shark uh, in uh, Shanghai. It started actually in Hong Kong. And right now we've uh, actually implementing all of these standards uh, globally uh, for them. We do sports and recreation. This is the, uh, uh, the Whitby Ability Center. We do transportation. Transportation, we've, we've done quite a bit of transportation in, uh, in Canada. We did the uh, uh, Terminal 3 uh, along with David Scott. And also we've done the infield development at Pearson, which is really a series of cargo buildings and a, a transit uh, terminal. And in China, we've actually done um, six airports um, and that are uh, uh, currently built. This is the latest one. Uh, it's in Urdus in Mongolia. And these, um, these airports tend to be in what they call second tier cities in China. And they are, when you say second tier cities, they're a population of 10 million to, you know, to 12 million. Um, so these, these airports tend to be around 20 gates to 25 gates. Uh, and recently we, uh, we won an award for a I mean, Tom talked a little bit about the small and the big. Uh, this is actually a very small uh, uh, bar restaurant that we just completed and had won uh, two awards in 2014, one from the Arido and the other one from uh, SBID in, uh, in London, England. Um, we have a landscape uh, team uh, as well as we do uh, uh, quite a bit of our um, staff actually are lead accredited and we uh, sustainability is actually now part of the DNA. Um, and I'm sure like many of the firms in here, it is really part of what you do. Um, we've also been involved with all the, the P3s, the public-private partnerships on the, all the deriv derivatives of them, design, build, uh, DBFNs, uh, and you name it, and it's, uh, for better or worse, there are some issues with them, uh, but nonetheless, we, uh, we have been uh, working with uh, 
a lot of consortiums such as PCL, LSDON, et cetera. This is the Humber College Library, which is currently uh, under construction, is almost complete. Uh, we also do, uh, again, uh, smaller things. This is actually a student uh, union uh, building in, uh, in the University of British Columbia. Um, and this is also another uh, student union uh, building. Uh, it's a hub that is in, uh, uh, in Windsor. I wanted to show you this one because this one is an interesting one. This is actually in Qatar, uh, and it is a postgraduate research and policy institute uh, for postgraduate students. It is literally built in the desert, and if you go on Google, you can actually see the foundation walls rising from the ground. But this was very interesting because it was a, a multidisciplinary uh, proposal. It involved the planning team, the architecture, interior design, and the, and the landscaping. We've also recently, um, as you know, most of the tall towers that have been built in the downtown Toronto that were built in the 70s were incredibly uh, inefficient. They, are, uh, they consume energy like you wouldn't believe. So we uh, got asked to actually look at the TD Tower and the Bank of Montreal uh, in the, with the idea of recliding them and uh, bringing their mechanical systems up to uh, where we need them to be nowadays. So they went from consumers of energy to actually providers of energy, especially in the case of uh, BMO. BMO on the weekend actually sells energy back now to, to the grid. Um, the TD was an interesting one because it was actually a historical landmark. And so we had to actually design these caps, these uh, mullion caps for the curtain wall system that uh, worked within the, uh, uh, the, the detailing that Ms. van der Rohe had, uh, had established. And uh, this is one of our recent uh, building that is now built on uh, at uh, college uh, and university. It's the Mars Tower, which I'm sure you you know all the issues with the Mars Tower and the <laughs> and the problems they're having. We also collaborate quite a bit with many many architects. This is uh, the Royal Bank. We did that uh, with KPF. Um, and with that, I thought maybe I want to talk now. Uh, and excuse me for indulging myself in going through what, what we have done. Um, so I deliberated quite a bit about what to really uh, present today. Um, and I thought what would be interesting in the end is actually to talk a little bit about healthcare. Uh, healthcare, uh, as you will see later on, is really going to be one of the uh, probably some of the largest global issues that we're going to be facing as, uh, as we develop and move forward. Um, we have quite a bit of an experience with healthcare that goes back 40 years ago. Um, and recently in uh, Singapore, uh, we entered um, uh, six hospital competitions, uh, five of which we won, and they're actually currently under, under construction. So um, I think part of what's going on, sorry, I'm, uh, the laptop is about to fall on me. But, um, I'll keep holding it, don't worry. Um, so we, we sort of thought that there were uh, a number of, of principles and guidelines that we wanted to actually guide our healthcare uh, experience. Uh, and as designers, we, uh, we know that the hospital uh, and what we do, how we design, how we articulate them, really should go beyond the fast uh, medical healthcare delivery. Uh, it goes into, uh, you know, how do you, how do you, uh, how you feel within the space. Our tools as designers are very limited, um, especially nowadays in the age of the of the P3s that I was talking about. So. Um, we need to shift the focus from reactive uh, process uh, of sick care to actually a preventative one. And this is now something that is quite prevalent. You see it everywhere. Um, 
it's in the schooling system. Uh, we, we are alerting kids to, to uh, really how to, what to eat, um, what they consume. Um, we wanna, uh, part of the challenges that we're having a lot nowadays uh, is that um, hospitals are becoming isolated and they are becoming entities on, on their own and highly clinical. So what we are trying to advocate uh, as an office is really to try and reintegrate the community and, uh, and the family into, into, into the process. So what I thought would be really interesting is to go through actually how we got where we are right now. And, and it's, it's kind of interesting to, to look historically about hospital, actually, the word, what does it mean? And it does come from the Latin word hospitalia. And it's really about, uh, about um, a, a place where strangers um, and guests can actually uh, be there uh, together. And of course, it all started um, as, a, as a community effort. And it really, uh, it started in, uh, in during the Crusaders, actually. That's, when the Crusaders used to be coming back from, uh, from uh, uh, the Middle East, uh, they needed care. So a lot of the uh, religious institutions actually looked after them. This is where hospitals originally started as an institution. The interesting thing, though, is that they were only for the Christians at the time. Um, what is really equally interesting is Islam was the first one that actually introduced the idea of open public uh, public hospitals. So as as um, mobility uh, started increasing, as uh, as transportation uh, population increased, so did uh, epidemics. So it became really more about isolating the sick, and and this was sort of the trend that we have been going through a, a trajectory. So where are we now? So hospitals now have become highly, highly sophisticated, complex buildings to design and develop, and very, very specialized. Uh, and, and, and now in the age of the P3s, uh, there are standards for everything. Your, 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 your clinical room has to be this size. The operating theater has to be this size. The uh, growth factor has to be this size. Circulation has to be this size. And in the age of the P3s, what's been happening now, the medical planning is actually starting to dictate how the buildings look like. And we are not getting fantastic buildings out of it. Um, we have put straight jackets around what we could do with them architecturally. Um, and so now, by the time the hospital is finished, all of a sudden, they realize they need to change something. All of a sudden, it's a major problem because we are so tight with space, we can't really transform it easily. So um, there is very little focus right now on really uh, on, on designing comfortable spaces. It is all really driven by formula. It's about the cost. And I can appreciate that because cost uh, is really horrendous. It is, uh, uh, healthcare is, is the second largest, um, uh, healthcare uh, is the second largest expense that a government goes through. So um, many of you, you know, we associate hospitals with illness. You know, I mean, none of us want to be there. I, frankly, I personally don't want to be there. And probably most of you don't want to be there. Um, so there was an interesting study that was conducted by the Women's College uh, looking at, they took around 1,000 uh, patients and they looked at, uh, they surveyed how they felt. And it's kind of alarming when you actually look at these statistics that, you know, uh, anxiousness, frustrated, uh, afraid. Well, why is that, you know? Um, Janet Bede, uh, the, uh, the CEO of Markham uh, Stovall Hospital, um, she told us that she wanted to, to change the idea 
that hospitals is where bad things happen. And we got involved with her, and I would like to show you later on uh, how we actually try to uh, work with that and change and transform the Markham Stobel Hospital into something that is more community, community uh, engaging. Now, I don't mean to really minimize the challenges that we're having in, with, with, with healthcare. Um, as I was saying, it is the second largest expense for, for governments. Uh, they spend almost 4.4% of uh, annually of their GDP on, on healthcare. Globally, it's around 10.2% of the GDP, which is around $1,000. Um, interestingly enough, the USA, this is a survey done in 2011, they actually spend 17.2 of their GDP. Compared to Canada, we're not doing so bad. You know, we, uh, we spend 10.9%. Singapore, on the other hand, which is really quite an interesting country, they spend only 4.7% of their GDP. Um, and they have some really interesting ideas and, uh, and thoughts about how, how to do it. They have a combination of, of private and, and subsidized uh, healthcare, which I can, I can, uh, I'll be more than happy to answer questions if there is any later on. Um, China, they are still, you know, uh, at the bottom of the, of the expense. They only spend around 5.4% of their GDP. Uh, and China is now just starting to uh, embark on, on a, a massive healthcare implementation reform uh, for their country. Uh, the challenges that China has is uh, the challenges with urbanization. What's happening is a lot of the rural community hospitals, people have no faith in them. Uh, so what tends to happen, they have these community hospitals that are sitting derelict. No one is using them. All the famous doctors, because they have families, they want to live in their cities, so they all go to the cities. And so it's putting tremendous pressure on the large cities such as Shanghai and Beijing, because that's where all the, the best equipped and the best... Uh, healthcare providers are located. So they have, they have a very different challenging thing ahead of them that they really need to deal with. They have to figure out how to build up the confidence in their community hospital system. So aging population is a huge thing. We're encountering it in here, and it's not only here, it's actually globally. Urbanization is a massive, massive problem. Uh, the, 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 the transition from rural into urban is creating not only good opportunities for a better education and better jobs, but also it's creating all of these totally unplanned settlements and developments that are you know, uh, what we call the slums, uh, and you can see them really everywhere. So bad sanitary conditions, uh, bad water, um, sort of disease, um, mental health issues, uh, violence, uh, criminal activities, etc. And right now, 53% of, um, of the population, the world population, actually lives in urban areas. And we're going to be looking at 70% by 2050. And it's a question that I always keep in the back of my mind is it really sustainable? Is that really the right formula uh, to, uh, to continue going to the urban centers and grow them into mega cities? Uh, because there's, there's a different counter argument to that, which we can talk about this later. But it's also interesting that even children nowadays, uh, you know, access to outdoors, they, they don't get out as much. Um, uh, the, 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 the adults, in, in, uh, <laughs> this is an interesting statistic, quarter of the British adults, they, they walk less than nine minutes a day. It's, it's pretty, pretty terrifying. And not only there, in, in Holland they're having some issues, 
um, and also overweight and obesity, they're discovering that there are a correlation between it and actually developing dementia at, uh, at earlier age. So all of these trends are actually contributing uh, to the transformation of the healthcare system. So it's, it's increasing the demand for quality care, for better care, a better delivery method, and better funding, of course. So how do we address it as, as, as designers? So I talked about a, a little bit about shifting from reactive uh, sickness to preventative wellness. Um, so, and that's already starting. You can actually see it in Singapore. Singapore has an interesting thing that they do in their public housing. They do the corridors, they do the elevators that stop at every third level. And so it will force the occupants to walk either up one floor or down one floor. So they're, they're actually stimulating them to be active, uh, you know, a little bit forcefully, but. But it seems, it seems it's interesting how, how they're, they're thinking about it. So we want to go away from the notion that hospitals are really about broken machines. And we want to get beyond that. We want to look at how do we promote wellness and support the people um, and, and support the, the, the healthy behavior. How do we actually integrate the community and the family, which, which we think actually is a huge uh, important element uh, if it can be integrated in the way we design, we design hospitals. So, um, you know, how do you, how do you get families to actually participate into the care of the patient? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little story. My father, before he passed away, uh, this was 24 years ago, um, in the last four weeks uh, when he was at the hospital after we had to admit him, um, my mother actually moved in with him. And the, the nurses actually cleared, they gave them a semi-room, semi-private room, and she stayed with him for four weeks, day and night. And what was really interesting about this is that she actually knew exactly the medication he needed. She knew exactly when he had to have it. So she became the nurse. So the nurses actually, in the end, had a much easier task. They tend to focus on other issues. And this was kind of interesting because that, that sort of uh, introduced a very different idea, which is really how do you help the system? How do you improve the healthcare delivery? Um, so can we do something like that in our hospitals? Can they be involved in the decision-making process? How do we physically accommodate them? And how do you get them engaged? So a lot of hospitals now are really isolated. We tend to build these isolated, especially uh, some of the greenfield sites, uh, the Niagara Health Services, for instance, that we just finished, was really just a, a greenfield that was donated uh, to, the, uh, to the healthcare services, and they built this, uh, this uh, huge, uh, almost 1 million square feet uh, hospital. Yet it is actually quite, quite detached. So we started thinking, you know, how can, we, how can we incorporate some of these social spaces that we all know and that we all admire uh, and, and have them and figure out a way of engaging the social realm back into uh, our community? How can we get inspiration from from some things that, you know, from the streets, from the plazas. How can we integrate that into a, a hospital uh, neighborhood? How can we uh, look at some of the, you know, this is, this is the, the, the high line in New York, and uh, you're all familiar with it. It's now becoming one of the prime tourist destination. You know, taking what's supposed to be a leftover space and transforming that into, into something that is really socially engaging and uh, that they, they, they celebrated by the entire community. So could we, for instance, take the roof of the diagnostic uh, block and transform that into a place where you can grow uh, vegetables that can be used into the, uh, the preparation of the food of the hospital? That's something actually we are doing right now in, in Singapore. 
So you all know this. Most of you are architects and designers. You know that spaces and the quality of the spaces that we design have a huge impact on what we do and how, how well we, uh, we get, not as patients, but also as staff. Um, so all of these, you know, access to, to natural light, access to gardens, all of these improve the quality uh, uh, and experience for not just the hospital, but for everyone else in the, uh, including the families and the staff. So like Ken, Ken for instance, everything we do uh, uh, creates, um, creates an impact on the urban environment that we do. Um, so on a large scale, how can that facility really uh, fit into the urban em environment? Is it accessible to the community at large? These were things that we were really starting to think about as we were, as we were designing the, uh, the facility. Uh, we got asked to do the, um, uh, the, uh, an entrance facility to St. Joseph Hospital Small little uh, addition, but really just transforming that entire um, space where actually now this little sculpture of, of, the, of, the, of the mother with the baby sitting on a bench is actually quite an interesting hub that uh, has become an interesting hub into, into the community. Again, small things, they don't have to be large uh, elements really small little things that, that can be meaningful. So what kind of experience, for instance, a patient will experience when they arrive, or a visitor? What happens on the ground floor of the hospital? Um, can you, for instance, and, and maybe that's something we should think about, um, like can you, for instance, transform the hospitals that they're not really just, you only have the flower shop and the postcard place, and you just grab a coffee. Can we actually transform that into something a little bit more meaningful? And it's kind of interesting because if you think about it a little bit back, airports used to be just simple machines that took you in and out of, of your destination. And then Dubai came in with the idea of transforming that into a free duty shopping mall. And right now, actually, probably many of you You've, you've traveled around and you've seen now how actually airports have become more shopping malls uh, than, than they're actually airports. So it introduced a very interesting dynamic into, into the process. So it's no longer uh, single-minded. So what kind of spaces, for instance, do, do we provide for, for uh, families in the, in the hospital? Can they actually share a meal with, with their loved one? Um, what kind of experience the patient actually will have as he steps out of the bed. So what I thought I wanted to do now, um, I wanted to show you three samples of uh, uh, some of the, these ideas that we've been um, experimenting with and implementing. Uh, one is gonna be in North America and the other two are gonna be in Singapore. Uh, so the Markham Stouffville, uh, as I talked about earlier, Janet Bean, uh, really wanted to uh, to look at how do we transform this from a place that people didn't feel comfortable with it to something that was a really more engaging into the community. Um, I don't have a pointer here, but I think you probably could all um, you could all read the uh, the script. But the existing hospital. Um, in the middle there used to be totally isolated and sitting on its own uh, in, a, in a greenfield site. It was totally disconnected from the community that, that it serves. So um, we got engaged to, into looking at the, at the master plan and looking at how can we actually try and engage the community back into, into, into uh, the, uh, the new addition, the new phase that we've added, which is to the left side, which is the phase one expansion. So there was a discussion with the city and there was a bit of a land swap between the hospital and the, uh, the municipal uh, uh, council where you know, uh, there was an idea about giving them uh, a location for the community center which then was integrated now closer to the existing hospital. And from there, we, we got uh, in, engaged into looking at how we can use the synergies 
between the community, hence uh, the, uh, the community uh, center and the kind of services that it provides, uh, the library and the kind of services that it provides, and how can we actually integrate that uh, between the hospital so that the entire community is actually engaged and uh, services are being used by, by, uh, by everyone. So the library, uh, the medical library was actually located in the, in the, uh, the Markham um, uh, library. So, and then we've sort of integrated and looked at uh, the nodes, looked at the hospital circulation, and looked at how the, you would integrate all of that together in a sort of in a seamless, uh, in a seamless way. So uh, getting, again, engagement between the community and the patients uh, and the visitors uh, at large. Um, and that was actually quite a successful uh, um, uh, uh, sort of master plan idea, and it's, uh, it, it, it is implemented right now, and Janet is actually quite happy with it because she said the amount of, of engagement by the community is actually quite fascinating. Um, Changi General Hospital was one of the competitions that we won. Um, what you're looking at, uh, it, it was a master plan for the, uh, the, the general hospital, which what you see there is sort of the H uh, right in the middle. Uh, in Singapore, they have the acute, subacute uh, clinics, uh, and the office, the doctor's offices are located in, in one place. Um, and that is really causing them um, quite a bit of problems. So we got asked to look at the master plan where we could uh, uh, help simplify the, uh, the, uh, the relationship. So what you see on the left-hand side was actually the subacute uh, hospital. Uh, we pulled it out from the main hospital. And what you see at the corner, sort of bottom uh, right-hand corner, is actually the administration office uh, sitting on top of the, of the clinic. So we basically brought in clarity and we uh, decluttered uh, so to speak, the, the hospital. And what was interesting, and what I wanted to share with you, is Singapore has a tiered system. Um, uh, so if you, if you decide to go into a ward of a, a 12 or 10 beds ward, you, uh, you don't have to pay for it. But then if you decide to go into a semi-private, uh, which, uh, sorry, the public wards are also, I wanted to highlight, are actually naturally ventilated. And in Singapore, tropical, this is quite a challenge to actually create a comfortable environment. So um, this was part of the mandate that we had to do. So 80% of the beds that we were providing actually had to be naturally ventilated. 20, the one designated for the private uh, people that can afford it, were actually uh, air conditioned. So they started giving us what they have now, which is 12 beds, uh, they sharing a, a partition in between, uh, open wards. And uh, so what we did, we transformed them into five beds, and we brought in the outdoor gardens into, into the wards. Um, and uh, what I wanted to highlight here before I forget is that the patients in here are actually patients that require rehabilitation. So the patients in these uh, subacute hospitals in Singapore, they stay here between six to eight weeks on average. So this is really sort of a home away from home for six to eight weeks until they finally go back to the community, or if not, they transition into the long-term care. So there is a, we structured a series of rehabilitation uh, uh, stages. One of them that really starts at the bed where the patient is very insecure and kind of want to be, uh, have a, a direct relationship with the nurse. We transform that into the, the semi-private space, which then will be another rehabilitation space that happens into, into the, the cluster. And then what we did is we so we took each ward and we looked at them actually as houses. They are, as I said, a home away from home. So we brought in the garden 
into the ward. And by what we've done this way also, because it is recessed and sheltered, it actually allowed for better airflow, uh, less exposure to the sun. Um, and then in addition to that, the semi-private space that we've introduced at the front of the house, which sort of was now starting to be seen as almost a, uh, the front porch of, of your house. And then what we've done is we've taken what they typically do, which is a simple linear arrangement of the wards with a corridor, and we've actually transformed it and changed it into a series of neighborhoods. So we clustered each house around a neighborhood, and then from these neighborhoods, then you get into the shared therapy spaces. This is where the patient actually gets a little bit more comfortable and they get a little bit better. Then they can actually transition into that, uh, that area and eventually from there uh, go, go back to, to their home. So, um, and we've also staggered, staggered the, uh, the beds as much as we can so that they're not looking at each other all the time. Uh, because, you know, five beds in a, in a ward is really quite, uh, quite, quite challenging for privacy. Um, so, um, so then we took the idea of the house, and we took the idea of the front porch, and we gave each one an identity. Uh, and what you're looking at in here is looking from the, uh, the, the common rehabilitation space into the semi-private, which is the front porch of the house, and looking beyond towards a naturally ventilated ward. Um, and we gave each, each house uh, an identity and a number. So the, uh, the panels uh, changed color, the, uh, the numbers changed, they were easily identifiable because some of these patients actually uh, were slightly demented, um, and uh, dementia patients require a lot of landmarks um, and things that are tangible that they can associate uh, themselves with. And then at, in addition to that, we've, we've also provided within those, those wards a common family eating area. Quite a bit of uh, uh, care that happens in Asia in general is that the family does look after the patients. They actually sometimes they bring in meals and they go up to that, and sometimes it's the entire family that comes in all together. And so um, we've, we've accommodated that within, within the, uh, the hospital. And then what we've done, we've articulated that uh, in the architecture. Um, uh, the site was um, a fairly congested site. Uh, it was an L-shaped um, site. And uh, we've articulated every house, so it actually manifested itself in the architecture when you see it from the outside. So a grandchild can actually look up and say, you know, my grandpa is actually in this house over there. Um, and um, uh, this, this building is currently built. Um, and uh, it's, I think it's, they're gonna finish commissioning it probably the end of the month. Um, so we took some of those ideas that we have started at Changi and we uh, looked at developing them on this other competition. It's called Senkang Regional Hospital. Um, Senkang was a massive hospital. It was uh, around 1,400 beds. Uh, it had uh, clinics, uh, emergency. It had uh, uh, offices. And it had um, 1,400 beds. 400 of them were actually for community hospital. Uh, the rest, around 200, were supposed to be swing beds, which are meant to transform from acute to subacute. Um, and uh, the site, again, was also a very challenging site, uh, surrounded by residential on the bottom uh, left-hand corner. There was an LRT that runs in an east-west direction uh, happening at the north. Um, and then a major artery street that runs uh, north-south, and there was a connection to the LRT station that is happening at the top right-hand corner of the... So the party was actually quite simple. 
uh, create a sort of a linear green park that stitched the hospital public social space that is on the ground floor of the hospital, which I'll show you uh, later, and, and introducing that as a, as a mitigating space uh, between the residential facilities and the hospital uh, itself. So uh, again, our tools as architects are fairly limited. Uh, the, uh, the massing was uh, quite simple. They were sort of butterfly-shaped inpatient units that there were three of them, clusters in three, that are all stitched together by a naturally ventilated uh, corridor uh, that sat and hovered above a diagnostic block uh, podium. There were uh, skylights and light wells that really oriented you and brought in the outdoors into the facility and brought in natural light into the, the facility. There was access to the LRT. Um, there was uh, a clear vehicular circulation. And we've created what we call the village commons all really on the ground floor of the, of the facility. So the, uh, the, the, the butterfly-shaped uh, wings uh, of the wards actually had quite a lot to do with the natural ventilation because to capitalize on the prevailing winds, we really had to orient them in such a way to capture as much of the flow of the, uh, of the air as, uh, as, as we can. Um, the, in addition to that, what we wanted to do, um, we wanted to clearly allow them, each ward, to have the ability to isolate it in case of a pandemic situation, um, uh, contain infections, because you know naturally ventilated uh, wards, if they're not carefully monitored, you can get a lot of infections uh, that can go through with the wind, <laughs> with the naturally ventilated. So um, at the same time, we started looking at how can you actually, in a naturally ventilated ward, how can you create every bed to actually have a, a view to the outside, um, uh, see the outside, how can we cluster them and still work within the classification that uh, Singapore has, the, uh, the type Bs and the type Cs and the type As of, of, the, of the beds. Um, so we created a module that actually worked with all sorts of arrangement that you could combine it all together um, in various forms that allowed them that flexibility uh, and convertibility, um, which they have wanted. Um, meanwhile, Along the periphery of this module, you'll see these overhanging gardens, these terraces. And these terraces actually did a dual purpose. Not only they provided a view and actually access to gardens up in the air, but at the same time, they, they provided massive amount of shading um, that was needed uh, in Singapore. Because Singapore, because it's, a, it's close to the equator, the sun actually comes at you almost at 45 degrees. So um, it demanded a huge cantilever um, to, to accommodate and, and deal with that. So um, we, we convinced them of the virtue of decentralized nursing stations and showed them the efficiency of how all of that work um, and, and also looked at decentralized charting stations and, and showed them also uh, this is when we started uh, first started implementing Revit, which is now being, seems to be the gospel uh, in healthcare. <laughs> um, so um, it was a qu quite an interesting uh, exercise. So um, with that, I'm going to show you, before I finish, and I don't know what the timing's like. I hope I didn't uh, extend. I'll show you a little bit of an anima animation of the Sinkang Hospital. And... Uh, and after that, maybe we'll... So this is approaching the, uh, uh, from the metro station, the first thing you come out and you encounter is really this uh, open plaza that is below the uh, clinics building. 
From there, you can take the escalators that takes you up with a connection to the LRT, <clears throat> the drop off to the emergency, the, uh, the green park that we created between the residential and the hospitals. And you're looking now down at the social village commons that we called on the ground level, looking at the uh, sort of some of the uh, conference facilities, uh, and then taking the DNT roof and transforming that into actually a garden that has to do with a bit of therapy for some for the rehabilitation, and also growing organic vegetables that is used uh, in the uh, in the in the kitchen of the hospital. And this is sort of looping around from the back, looking at the drop off for the community hospital and the the acute hospital, um, and panning out as you see the, the LRT. Um, and with that, I thank you. Thank you. Um, I wouldn't, I think you've made the presumption that the room is filled with architects. It's, it's not. It's, oh, I, it's filled with the I met so many of them, I thought. <laughs> Everybody you met was an architect, but it's filled with a broad range of folks. Oh, fantastic. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Apologies. No. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Um, what that does is it, um, you, Rhoda, usually I think take in a, a trip that's in, you know, we're so used to having the what. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we talked about sharing, uh, entertaining some questions. Of you course. Guys? Yes. Let's do that. Are there any questions for, for David? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, uh, I think the idea of engaging the family and accommodating them in our hospital facility would be something that we should bring in. Um, and I think uh, recently there had been a discussion about whether we should allow visitors 24 hours uh, visiting rights, uh, which is now has been in the news recently. Because as you know right now, it's 8 to 8, and you can't visit your loved one after 8 o'clock. Um, and a lot of, lot of the families, you know what, they work, they finish work at six, they go home, they cook for their kids. By the time they decide to go and visit someone in the hospital, too bad, it's too late. So I think some of these can be brought in. The idea of introducing a little bit of commercial activities into the hospital is actually quite a valid one. I mean, not only uh, socially of what it does, because it also engages the community, but also monetarily, it actually can help fund some of the programs that we have nowadays in, uh, in hospitals. And I know I'm simplifying things because the, the funding formula in, in, in Canada and in North America is, is really highly, highly complex. But there are certain things that, that as designers we could implement that can actually help mitigate and go a long way. And some of these lessons we've, we've, we've learned and we've seen, uh, doing a lot with simple things 
uh, and we could we could implement this in uh, in Canada. You know, shallower floor plates, access to natural light. I mean, you go to a diagnostic block in North America, it's like 40 meters deep. It's dark. You you get lost. I mean, I uh, I worked on the Niagara Health Hospital. Um, uh, you think I designed it, I know it upside down. I get lost in it, you know? <laughs> I get lost in it, you know? Uh, it's just, but using those cues, uh, you know, natural light, gardens, etc. these landmarks within the design, that we can actually bring, bring forward. And I think, frankly, I think maybe, maybe the P3s are not the right formula for healthcare. Uh, in in in, uh, in North America and in Canada, anyways, right now, I think we need to to think a little bit beyond that, because we're not producing better healthcare facilities. And actually, I'm not even sure whether they're cheaper. In the end. Yes, there's a question. You mean in North America? I haven't seen any yet, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a trend that is actually starting even in England. We seem to be always, we seem to be always like 20 years behind England. They started the design build P3, uh, large mega hospitals, and now they're realizing that's not the formula that's actually working for them. Exactly. Exactly, and it's cheaper. It's much cheaper. It is, it is, it is, it is, it is. And I think you know what? I think it would be just a matter of time. Yeah. I mean, the the Europeans are way ahead of us in terms of uh, this uh, forward thinking about healthcare. Uh, I was in um, in uh, Holland actually, and I saw something that was really, really refreshing. Uh, it was a dementia village. Um, and uh, it was fascinating because you, I, I walked into this village that is totally integrated into the community. Uh, it had uh, a theater that people from the outside come and watch shows as well as the patients actually come in and watch shows. It had a bar and a restaurant. Uh, and then the, the way they organized it, it was actually clustered around uh, a series of houses, which were uh, very interesting, small, uh, intimate houses, uh, 10 patients uh, per house. They had their own kitchen, they had their own living room, uh, their own dining room. And the interesting thing is when you bring your loved one, uh, they, they did a survey in Holland and they found that uh, People in Holland tend to, you can group them into seven, seven kind of types of living. There is the aristocrats, there is the modernists, there is the hedonistic, and there is the, I forgot the, the names of them. So what was interesting is the first thing you do when you bring your loved one who's, uh, who has suffered from dementia is you actually um, fill out a survey. And from that survey, they determine which is the type of house that is appropriate for the patient. So this entire village, they were all demented people. But you couldn't tell. You could not tell. They are happy. They walk around. They, they do their own business. They are comfortable. They know their surroundings. And it was actually quite refreshing to see something like that uh, happening. I mean, we tend to create these sort of long tracks so the demented patient can just walk and walk and walk and walk and walk and walk. 
And it was kind of refreshing to see that the way they're thinking about it is, no, you know what? 60 years of your life, you've lived in a house. And all of a sudden, you woke up one day, you can't remember where you put your phone. And everything is, has changed for you. So how do you, how do you deal with that? So it was very, very interesting. So I think it's just a matter of time. I think we'll, uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. Mm -hmm. Wonderful yes. Second, yes. Yes. That is great. That is fantastic. Was it built under P3? That's just Tom's family's work. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean, you know what? Yes, we need to get back to some of these. Mm. That's another challenge we're facing. Sounds like it. Oh, sorry. Well, I think this is this the health um, promotion aspect of hospitals. <clears throat> Talking about a little more in the weekend to sort of look forward into what the new trends are. I, I also think, though, it's a really interesting line because I think it could be one of the other types of projects. Mm -hmm. I haven't personally yet. I've been, I've been. Uh, um, I mean, other other than some of the educational facilities where we have been introducing some of those ideas, um, the um, we we haven't been uh, implementing some of those yet. But that that's a very, very interesting thought. I think we should probably do so. Thank you.